through it pretty much the simplest way we can. Uh, just about some indicator confluence stuff, kind of focusing on the flow index. Um, if you have any issue with it not working for you, let me know and we'll try and sort it out for everyone. Since uh, it's not technically on our system right now, it's just we manually mm -hmm. added everyone while we're waiting for the uh, uh, our automated system kind of pick it up. It just takes a day or two to, to do a bunch of checks to make sure it works. So, any case, the new update for the Crypto Flow Index. Um, are you recording, by the way? Yep. Okay, cool. Perfect, perfect. So, the biggest update that we saw basically is that we got rid of all of the the fact that it was 20 different lines and it was hard to see stuff, you had to tick stuff off manually. Now you can just tick stuff off as you're looking at it, which is important. It's all great stuff that allows you to see the, the big flips. The biggest one that I saw is it, that helps me the most, since I mostly trade large caps, uh, is looking at stable coins and large caps specifically and the inverse correlation between them. So when you start seeing the move up with Bitcoin, almost always you'll see that the same move opposite with stable coins so it's a pretty significant move overall especially in the like when we had the move here we saw that increase and we saw the decrease in the same exact candle so the fact that we're seeing those kind of correlations it's really nice and it's really powerful and especially when we start getting to the highs of these levels when hey you know we're going back to the upset stable coins getting exited because people are entering into altcoins and small caps and stuff like that uh, it just helps because you can now pinpoint what you're looking for a little bit more specifically and uh, with everything on the chart, we actually get to see a pretty cool thing happen, which is, you know, what's leading where. Shit coins and large caps are moving better than alts right now, which is a pretty weird situation most of the time. We have one going, then the next one, then the next one. But hey, they're all moving, and that's good, technically. So until that changes, it is what it is. And most of the time when we see, like, the flush out moves, with Bitcoin moving the upside, we also saw the same opposite effect in altcoins and shitcoins. So essentially what you end up getting is once we start running into these flat zones, we're starting going sideways on the high caps. We're seeing big moves and higher lows created on the flow index, which says, hey, there's still continuation moves uh, for smaller cap coins, which is what we've been seeing. So a lot of the more natural good moves that we see overall are when we see Bitcoin go first, large cap goes first, and then stable coins going down with everything else. Once this thing stabilizes, we look for alts, we look for shit coins to potentially move back to the upside. So nice little way to use that on top of all the other things you can use. And then with the table itself, right, you can reposition it anywhere you want or even turn it off. Uh, you can change this label size. And something that's a bit interesting too is that we've got it set where so whatever time frame you're on, and let's say you want to see a bigger, higher time frame kind of chart of like what's going on with the index, I can click higher time frame data on, and it'll give me a larger percentage move of what's going on um, above me. So instead of focusing on the low time frames, because you'll get tunnel vision, right? This is kind of what helps me generally thinking of, well, whatever's going on higher time frame is going to be the most relevant. When we have major breakdowns of stuff like, hey, all of a sudden we could do this little move down, but at the same time we have this move down, uh, alts are starting to move back to the upside, right? So we start moving down, shit coins start moving to the upside, um, alts start moving to the upside, grinding back down, and then everything starts moving together with shit coins going pretty high. So you can use that to kind of say, well, right now all of the coins higher time frame are doing very strong quite high moves comparatively to most things and stable coins are kind of coming back to the downside we're starting to break a little bit on alts higher time frame than what we're looking at currently and that's going to be an interesting one if we start actually gaining stuff back on the stable coins so if we do start flushing down what we should see then would be stable coins going up and some of these things breaking down essentially giving us you know, higher high there, uh, lower high there, right? So that's essentially what we're looking for. And once we see those kind of breakdowns, if you start seeing routes where where maybe DeFi or shitcoins start breaking really hard down compared to most things, that means shitcoins are getting absolutely crushed and people are exiting out of that into stable coins and into high caps. So another good little way to use it and... Um, the other thing, too, is being able to use the different sectors. We could break it down into subsectors now. So if you want to use the high time frame to see, uh, you know, the large categories of coins, 
that's fine. It's a great tool for using that as well. But breaking it into the smaller subsectors, you can kind of target stuff better, especially if you're looking for, you know, DeFi shitcoins, altcoins, whatever you have you, uh, more specifically. So if you know what's going on here where, hey, you know, alts are doing pretty good, uh, large caps are doing pretty good. And literally, I mean, geez, that's funny. It's like right when I said it on the stream too, it's like alts and large caps were doing good. Now we saw that high caps are breaking down, like large caps are breaking down a bit. Stable coins are breaking up a bit. And um, the other thing is like shit coins are doing okay still. They haven't really broken down uh, to the downside yet at all. Let's wait for this thing to load. Maybe we can go in a higher time frame. It's a pretty resource heavy thing along with most of the other things that we have, unfortunately. And I think that's mostly because it's, what's it called? There we go. Can you guys see that? It's AI, huh? <laughs> it's AI, yeah. Well, we couldn't change the flow score thing. So the one that has the highest move on the top because it was, it was wrecking the table and it was changing too much stuff. So unfortunately, it's still just, you know, alphabetical order. But um, even here, we, we, can ch we can change it now to where maybe we have the neutral color as yellow. So essentially what we Drop get is uh, the stoplight system where we see things that are kind of like a heat map of a like green, good, you know, starting to get turned orange and red, bad, essentially, which I like. It's a pretty easy system to use. But even now, what are we seeing that's doing very well? Meme coins leading the charge, looking at Doge and stuff. Doge is up 4% on the day. Uh, SHIB is up, you know, it's okay, like 1.5%. But that's a pretty good tell overall that it's doing that kind of high end move compared to most things on the other hand we have things like sports tokens which are lagging compared to everything else uh, significantly so memes are doing great smart contracts are doing great ai is still doing decent gaming decent so when we start seeing a breakdown we want to see start shorting things that are going to be doing worse than other things with meme doing quite significantly good upsides and has been over the like, kind of market cycle we've had you'd want to see things that have been doing quite poorly overall so one thing we can look to kind of ex to, to split these up is kind of select things that you're mostly interested in so ai is going to be an interesting one um we'll turn memes on metaverse off nft off privacy off um sports tokens off exchange yeah we'll leave that those those actually we'll leave dexes on because dexes are interesting so what we're seeing now is a little bit better disparity in the different kind of stuff that we have. So even though the co you could change the colors as well, but everything's moving quite well together. When we see the major differences in some of these more specific ones, because these are easier to target in my opinion, stuff like FET, some, you know, other AI tokens, when they start breaking the upside, breaking away you know, here as we see that, that to FET and AI tokens broke away from the rest of the pack, they're going to be doing significantly better if we have move, moves back into the market up to the upside. So even now, everything's relatively in the same spot, same roundabout flow score. Uh, Dex is an exchange. Dex is doing the worst out of the group. So when stuff starts breaking back down, if we start losing price, and we start flipping through our different subsectors, we want to start targeting the stuff that's losing levels the fastest. Um, that will kind of give you an indication of what's the best short in the continuation move down. So... A lot of good th tools to use with that. Um, changing the colors, turning everything off and on. Pretty simple stuff, really. Um, it's mostly just ease of use to kind of, you know, make things easy to handle. Uh, what's the correlation? What that mean? So correlation is, is based on general market correlation. So because the large caps control most of the dominance, their correlation is going to be quite high. Stable coins are basically an inverse correlation of the market, right? So if the, if the market's going up stable coins are going down because people are entering into the market things that are not correlating as much which means that if the market starts moving down and their correlation score is down they're going to be less viable um as options because they're not trading the same as everything else they're, they're outliers so you want things that have like high correlation scores or higher and things that are moving together you know, at the end of the day, I think flow score is the most important because it shows the flow of money into different things compared to other things. So when you're actually looking at the correlation, that's going to be kind of like if you have two things with the same flow score 
and markets are moving up, but one thing has a higher correlation than the other, you pick the thing that has the higher correlation because it's going to be more uh, more often than not trading with the rest of the market. So, in, se- in a sense, it's general correlation to price going up. That means that stable coins are going, uh, you know, and so people are exiting into st- or leaving stable coins. The so stable coin flow is down. Essentially, it's the same as, you know, our our uh, what do you call it? Our stable coin supply. What it, yeah, the retail stable coin demand. So the fact that we have like in a very similar sense, we're seeing here that price go lower. It's like if I put this back on. You know, not inverted. It looks very, very similar, right? So it's just kind of like a double confirmation. But now we're able to see demand in other things as well. Large caps, altcoins, that type of thing. So pretty helpful, I believe, overall. Have you guys had a chance to play with it? No? A little bit? I know you've been messing with it a lot, Eagle. Yeah, but uh, the old version of it. Yeah. But I use it more or less daily. To check where things are compared to others. Yeah, it's it's just good to like see where you're where you're looking to allocate stuff into. I mean, this is always like one of the bigger ones in my head when you see a big disparity between like one thing versus you know the other caps. When everything's kind of trading together, that means the market's generally up. And stablecoin demands regularly, regu- relatively down. Um, then we start bringing other things into it, right? We can turn that off and just leave like the oscillator. We start to see well. Also, you can turn the labels off if you just want to look at the scores. So, if I just turn off labels, you know, even here, what what do you see that's kind of doing similar to this move, right? Lower high technically. Uh, but still generally good flow into large caps. Large caps still leading the way on the four hour. The and when you drop it down lower time uh-huh. frames, you start to see a little bit of more actionable lower time frame changes. So this is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. So even at these little flush outs, you'll see high caps go. Start retracing again as stable coins start legging back up. You can look to short a little bit. Now the deep, that shit coins low time frame have a very high flow score, even though they're not as correlated. That means DeFi is probably the next thing. If we start breaking to the downside, I'd probably say DeFi is at the highest point. So DeFi probably has a good chance to like start losing some levels to the downside. Uh, if we start making this move, we should see DeFi go there and then stable coins go up uh, comparably. So overall, what I'm kind of looking for in general is to see things that, you know, it'll move similar to stuff like Harmony and whatnot, but I want to see the flow of money going in and out of things. And... Um, one of the best things I've used with this was just using the high time frame because then I could start seeing like where the high time frame changes are and that high time frame change kind of tells me what's going on generally in the market. So even here, you know, altcoins already made their move, making their move down to most things. DeFi has Nine. made the move down. DeFi on the higher time frame Nine. has a very high flow score compared to everything else. So DeFi is still doing very well. So what, where would I be looking at a DeFi? I'd be looking at DeFi products that are starting to break and lose levels to short them down lower as stable coins go up and DeFi has the longest way to go back to the downside. That's 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 a way I would look at that as far as like a correlation. So Yeah, and even now it looks pretty decent. But um yeah, the funding also, interestingly enough, with the Shanghai update, and this was something I wanted to mention, but I didn't really go into it. Uh, ETH is the blue line here on the funding. ETH is very, very rarely uh, changing. It's usually a very flat line comparatively to most things. So even in the last upside move, we saw a lot of bearish ETH funding. Now we're seeing a little bit of ETH bearish ETH funding compared to Bitcoin, which is still very, very bullish funding overall. And that's a good thing, right? When we see that type of bullish funding, that means people are buying uh, compared to, you know, just magically taking uh, spot longs. So even on if I look at perpetuals as an example, uh, spot is higher, is just below, excuse me, just below perpetual. So they're influencing like longs in the market still, which is nice. So bullish funding, 
generally we're getting a little bit higher on the uh, stablecoin commands coming back down or going back up excuse me where the flow is going up so lower time frame you could see a little bit of failure right as we come back down and then what would do be the most effective if we start losing levels just look at DeFi. but you wait for the break and that kind of tells you what's going on so the other point of this stuff is like confirmation tools with the rest of the indicators that we have and kind of focusing on the price action part of it so let's see here put the volume blocks on one of the best things we can do especially because now again i'm looking at a higher time frame i've got a higher time frame on flow ticked on so we're seeing you know the four hour essentially we're on the one hour we're seeing the four hour flow four hour flow is still very high what are we seeing on the price price is still moving to the upside Starting to see a little bit of toppiness on trend, which is a thicker line on harmony. Bullish funding still in. We've still set up a you know, major move of the upside since we had some bearish deviation or bearish, um, uh, what is it called? Bearish divergence. And now we saw some bullish divergence. Now we're moving back to the upside. We're starting to see that we're kind of at a top, not quite breaking it yet on the four hour. Well, if we drop it down on the flow, we're starting to see that we're starting to break down a little bit. See? So we're starting to break down a little bit. Uh, a little bit. So it's going to be important using this kind of information to say, well, what are we actually doing? Well, we're at the height of this range, right? We know that price action says we need to test stuff above us. What are we testing here? Well, we're testing the high closes around the one hour, around the 15 minutes, stuff around 30.29, 30.3. And this is kind of the high structure. If we start breaking some, you know, lower time frame lows, we can kind of assume that the flow is starting to change more significantly, and then that stable coin kind of move back up, goes to its peak. So usually, if that starts moving up, which it is, right? Stable coin is moving back up right now. You're looking to, for potentially shorting it back to the downside, uh, and if it does have the continuation, stable coin then needs to drop down and make uh, on the flow needs to make new lows, and we have a continuation move here. Uh, on the harmony indicator but um again the way we're using this all together essentially is saying well we know that stablecoin flow is down we know that DeFi is up that all high caps right are down a little bit from their highs so what do we want to see it's still continuing until we break something it's a local break breaking something like 31.8 Right, we start breaking some structure, then we start seeing some failures, then we start seeing some more moves back up on stable coin and, and they start crossing over, and then we see the failure back to the downside. So again, using some simple price action stuff of gain loss of level, flow, we wait for the levels to confirm that we're breaking them. If you try to short this now, you're essentially shorting in an upside move. The priority is still technically up, the trend is still up, everything is still going to the upside right so if you're in the longs from from what we had earlier you know lot yesterday and, and stuff talking about these lows the regain level you're fine you're safe take some profit but if you're looking for failures what are the things we're looking at well we're at the high of the range right this is still technically resistance we're starting to see some breakdown we're starting to see some higher moves on the stable coin flow but we haven't lost any levels yet what do you want to see in the confirmation? You lose some local levels. Until that happens, the trend is up. So when you start seeing that reversal, you say, hey, I want to look at that level, right click on it, add an alert on that ray. Once it breaks it, then I come back to it. Until then, until something starts reversing, the price is going to go up. So we can play this stuff on lower time frames as well. And I, it, gets, it gets more interesting, of course, but at the end of the day, the lower time frame plays are always going to be more of a, um, I, don't know, I guess, a, a lot more dangerous than anything else. We've done some stuff. I haven't really used the flow on the low time frame. I don't even know if you can. Um, but generally, stuff like this, you know, just looking at this at the oscillator. Again, stable coins very bottomed, and we're on the one minute. O oscillators topped out. We're breaking into sideways structure to the upside. So what do we look for? We look for the potential failure here to come back down to test stuff. And that's what you see. You see the stable coin starting to drop. That's starting to drop. So you look for the short back down to test structure. 
and then you reassess. If you gain back that level that you're failing at, that's the invalidation. And that's all you're doing, is going to play these levels invalidation to invalidation. So, even here, we had increasing bullish uh, funding as we were gaining levels and going to the upside. It's coming back down now at the same time, right? We had the, the change in funding happened. What does that mean? It's a leading indicator. You have a massive change, even low time frame, in funding. What do you look for? You look for a local top, and then you look to fail back down. You can hold that level, that's fine, but it should break back down to the downside. So it's, it's an interesting way to use this stuff, and it uh, it's definitely useful in that sense. There's a question in there. Is, is it possible to watch sectors and some of the subsectors together? We've changed it now to where you can't have them both on at the same time because it's just so much information. But I would, honestly, I would say you're better off if you're going to be using this as like sector and subsector is to actually add another version of the indicator on. So you put the flow index um, back to, you know, a second one and then put that one on uh, subsectors. And then you can select which one specifically. Because what happens is even if you start ticking stuff on and off, you'll start seeing a disparity and you'll start like kind of second guessing it. At least that's what we found when we were messing around with it. Uh, to test stuff, so um, like e let me see if I put that on there. I'm gonna put on subsectors. So stuff like that. So you can see that like the dexes and all these things are being hurt. Yeah, stable dropped fast. Again, this is much more of a higher time frame tool. Uh, low time frame, you can use it just like you can everything else. Because um, conditions don't have to be met lower time frame. It can still play out essentially this little garbage before failing again, which is very possible. So I would rec recommend staying on the 15 minute. That's usually the level that you really care about or higher. Uh, essentially, oh wait, broke it on the, on the 15. So if you're going to have both open, something like on the one hour, so you can see kind of like the flow of what, what's going where. I think that's the best kind of option. We might bring it back to where we can split and you can just choose what's in the table. But now the problem that we were having is that there's just too much information. So even now you have like the big chart instead of being able to tick them off entirely. So AI outperforming exchanges and whatnot. Or at least that's the best way I found to use it. You could also, if you wanted to, um, this is another way to use it. If you turn off the table and the labels, I'll keep that on there and then I'll add that. So you can kind of match them. Again, it's a little bit more resource heavy looking at the different stuff like in that sense. But it allows you then to be really specific. Okay, I'm really interested in AI tokens, you know, watching FET and all these things. Oh, nice. So AI very performing extremely well. Cool beans. So yeah, AI is still performing very well compared to most things. Uh, alts and shitcoins still lagging comparatively. And uh, even large caps not performing as well, even though we're having a little bit of a breakout move here. Up into like 30.4, so that's cool. And then we can use that stuff lower time frame as well. Again, this is why you don't trade the one minute, right? What do we see? That would have been the gain. And that broke it. You're break, breaking everything today, huh? Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm running a couple other things on the site at the same time, so that's my own fault. <laughs> So even here on like the one on the 15 minute, um, 
you know, you've got altcoins that are being severely outperformed by everything else. Uh, Bitcoin and everything else going up significantly better than most things. Stable coins are going back down. Shit coins and DeFi breaking heavily to the downside. So this is a big, this is a pretty heavy large cap move compared to most things. As shit coins, DeFi, and stables all going down. So this could, eh, well, it's still breaking out. We still could see the the continuation move higher if we start getting some tests into this stuff. Again, simple price action stuff. We'll be looking for swing level test. That's the level to gain above. Bricks us back into some bigger structure. If this thing starts going sideways now, we want to see things like uh, altcoins start to improve and do a little bit better. Because they're essentially being left alone, uh, not really catching a lot of these moves compared to most things. So yeah, there is a way to use it, especially like a, like I said, Maria. Um, if you use it together like that, I think the best tool is just to kind of switch between them. Because once you understand what's going on with you know on the one hour, four hour above, with with the flow, then you can kind of look on the lower time frames as well, or the different subsectors. Yep, and this is largely flow uh, driven by by large caps. You know, on the one hour. Oh, oh, push on. Mm -hmm. Nice, everything is moving up. Yeah, all season is starting. Alt season starting? Yeah, you heard it there first. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite yet. Could be. Could have been the start of it from from here, but I want to gain something back. So yeah, overall, just a little bit of like extra stuff you can use with it, and then using these levels as well. From your own being able to use the price action levels that we see, getting into the highs. Uh, some people also with the SRs from the auto charting tools, they get a bit confused on how to use this, so I'll kind of just clarify it. When you have these higher time frame levels, they're much more important with higher time frame price action. So like the daily losing the level or the weekly losing the level, when you're talking about like monthly and quarterly, right? When you're talking about daily and three day, you're talking about like one hour and four hour levels that we want to see tested. So, you know, that's the daily high. That's the SR that's important. We've got the three-day at 3,600. If we gain 3,600, where do we expect to go? Somewhere up into this 31 zone, probably. So, until then, strong upside move still. Very much being driven right now by, by large caps, not alts. So, that's nice to see. But um, with the move up with that, we're seeing stablecoin kind of going down. Again, people are still getting allocated in the crypto and getting it out more and more allocated. And if we don't make highs or even if we make new highs and close back below in the same candle, what does that tell you? Well, it essentially tells you that we're um, deviating. We're grabbing liquidity to the upside. So it's still very possible. And you want to see, again, the confirmation is close above, bullish retest. And it's better to be skipped than try and jump the gun. Mm -hmm. It's always the, the patient patient move that works consistently. So Yeah, even the fifteen or the one hour looks pretty strong. Not closing above anything, but still it's a lot of levels, a lot of important stuff being tested. Essentially all we're trying to do here is kind of use confluence as a tool. Right? As long as we have the confluence to say, like, well, we've, we're doing this, this, and this. We've got several levels of confluence, and at the end of the day, it's gaining or losing levels, right? Is it gaining it, or is it testing it bearishly? Like, that's the question. Currently, it's testing it bearishly. It's testing the structure of these highs that we created bearishly, right? If it closes above, creating new high level closes, and then bullishly back tests, that's what we care about. Until then, you're in the range. You look to short the highs and long the lows until you're proven otherwise. And gaining above, right, 
and bullshit back testing, that's that's gain a level. And this is what, what, why we have the confluence. Because the more and more we use this, the easier it becomes. Oh, we're at the lows of the level, and then at the same time, we're doing bullish deviations down to the lows, and we're doing higher lows. Like, you know, there's your sign, essentially. What about at the highs of this structure here? Starting to get some yellow dots, some yellow dots. Are we losing levels, price action levels? No, not yet. Uh, we go to the upside, we start failing, and then we see that stable coins going up, uh, or going going up, and all the caps are going down. Essentially, that's all we're seeing is kind of like the flow of money in and out of the different sectors. So it's pretty easy to use in that sense. You can kind of just swap between the two or three of them. And then liquidity, of course, which the big thing there being we've got a lot of liquidity uh, stacked right below, uh, below us, much, much, much more than above us. So if we do start breaking down, there are some arguments that we should start sweeping some lows. Uh, something that a lot of people haven't used in a while as well is the, the bands. And I'll be honest, I don't use it that much myself except for the higher time frame stuff. But again, what do we generally see? Even from this move to the downside and move back to the upside, we've grabbed all of the stuff to the upside that we could possibly grab, or most of it, right? And these aren't VWAP bands or anything like that. These are literally the liquidation bands. Um, what are we getting into? We're getting into the high stuff that we've grabbed lots of 10x major short liquidity in all of the overall structure. So... If you are trying to take positions, understand that they're wrecking 10x shorts, even, or 10x longs, even though we see we usually feel pretty confident with those. So that's a pretty big deal. The fact that we usually do these 10x moves up, like we grab 10x, sometimes we grab the 5x moves up before we're going back to the downside. So we're quite overextended generally. And when we come back to center, if we're in a bullish uptrend, you'll see that kind of like center line being held. If we start breaking it back to the downside, that's usually when we have the retracement back down to sweep the lower liquidity. So we're still on the upside move, still potentially grabbing some liquidity. Is there a lot more to grab? Higher time frame? Uh, I'm not really sure. And we can use it on a lower time frame as well. It just, you have to use it as a per time frame like correlation. Uh, we're grabbing even like the 5x is on like the one hour. We're grabbing the 10, you know, the, the, the 10x is on like the hourly candle. The four hours is the sweet spot, in my mind, to use this thing. And you can use it on most things to see liquidation levels. So, when we have these upside sharp moves, you're looking for failures, just because it's a matter of liquidity, and that's what the market does. Wherever there is liquidity, the price will always gravitate towards it. So, if we start sweeping back to the downside now, where do we kind of target? 26, maybe even breaking down to 21.5, and if they want to be really mean and grab a lot of liquidity, they go down to 23 and they grab all the 5x longs and wreck everything going back to mid-March if they want to start wrecking it. So, it's always going to be mindful of where the liquidity is. The liquidity is generally the direction of travel for the market most of the time. And again, even on the 4-hour, you see a couple things that don't really change, which is a lot of major liquidity hasn't been taken in a long time. Um, the big pockets to take, losing the low here should flush us into the next low, you know, probably at like 26.3, 26.7, that type of stuff. So once we get back into this zone, what ha what's the next move down? You flush all the 10x longs that were built up since mid-March, and then where does that take you? It takes you to 21.5. A lot of the levels, we, or excuse me, 25k, 25 <clears throat> So a lot of these levels, there's a lot of overlap and correlation. And the big overlap levels are where you have pockets of the same liquidity in the same space. And that's generally where you go to, to, to essentially gain or lose liquidity. Any questions on any of these stuff or the, the indicators in general? Yeah, thanks, Maria. I'm glad that I hope that worked for you. But yeah, a lot of the time, a lot of times, if I'm trying to do different things with some of the indicators, I'll actually just load two up on there, regardless of what it is, to try and find some better settings. You know, it's like what I do with uh, like the oscillator. Sometimes, if I'm trying to be really specific, I'll turn off the shaft trend cycle because that fires very, very fast and it changes it ever so slightly. Right. Sluta. So, 
a couple small things like that generally help quite a bit. I think also I'm going to start, we might look to swap out the SRs since these, most of the time people don't even use them because they're confusing to most people. I try to bring in like the way I automatically plot with like weekly and monthly SRs uh, and potentially even bringing in to show multiple days opens and stuff like that. To, to kind of harp on the more of the price action of ranges and range highs and previous range highs and stuff. Um, that's something that I, you know, myself, I generally just plot it in. But even showing showing things like, you know, daily ranges uh, can be very, very helpful, especially if you're looking at um, highs and lows or closes. So seeing highs and lows isn't as effective in my mind as it is to look at stuff like the open and close of the ranges, because now you're being able to see all the different dailies uh, in the current price action. As long as it loads up here. So yeah, and it helps you kind of gauge out like where you're actually gaining and losing levels overall. Which is interesting. I'm plus two UTC, so. Holding range lows, gaining into some higher range structure. Putting into the weekly. Let's see. And mostly it's because I want to be able to see other information, like more so than what I'm seeing currently. You know, if we start breaking back down, we have a lot of the major weekly levels right around this 28 level. So what happens if we start failing this stuff? You should go much lower than you expect to go, generally. Breaking us back into like the low ranges back at 25, that type of thing. So you can use it to target stuff, but generally it's a confluence tool in that sense. It allows you also to see the, the different open and closes of previous daily and weekly candles, which are very, very often targeted. You know, and it's, a, and it's very simple. Just showing that. Change the range type to open and close, and you get to see all of the daily and weekly monthly opens and closes for the last however many however many days, going back quite a bit. So it's a pretty effective tool in that sense. And all, very often times they're going to be very, very relevant, to, especially to lower price action, 15 minute and stuff, if you're on, you know, if, you, if you're looking for daily retest the previous structure. And essentially what you got here was the creation of the low of the range. Right, where you're at now, you're essentially at the high of it, even higher than the previous closes. So, you're technically a little bit too high time frame for it. So yeah, even there, now we're looking at stuff in that sense that, well, what are we trying to solve, or what are we trying to do? What's the levels of break back down to? You know, twenty three one. That's essentially the monthly levels that we can't lose, and this is kind of like a high time frame. Something that I use sometimes when I'm doing my own charts to kind of like look at major ranges in the overall price action. I'll just tick these off real quick. So now I'm getting like monthly ranges for structure. That's so important because it, now it allows me to see like what the major levels are if we break down. You know, if we break down from here, where do we have to hold 23.1? Right. Why, why was the gain back in January such a significant gain? Well, because you're gaining back all of like the pre-FTX November trash and gaining back those highs that became like, you know, essentially the resistance to support line higher time frame. So, you know, with a lot of these things, you end up getting, you know, the important levels macro on the chart. If we break back to the downside, we want to see holds of like that 28 level, 28.5. Why? What happens if we start breaking under this? Uh, going in into this structure, well, we start failing, and if we start failing back down, like let's say worst case right now, we do a Bart Simpson just straight down, close onto this level onto the structure. What else do we know? Well, we also know things like liquidations. We also know that there's a lot of liquidity here and a lot of liquidity at 25k. So if we know these things, what can we say? What we don't want to lose? Well, even if we sweep all of this trash and do a major down move, something like what we did back in you know uh, beginning of March. What do we not want to lose? The 23.1. This is why this has become like the most important level if we break back down. Because if we start losing that, we're losing a monthly range. And um, it's significant enough to be like two. So it's not just that. It was also like the January close. It was also like the, uh, the Fe what is it? The April, or was it the March? 
I'm on the wrong level. There we go. Yeah. Is that over there at the beginning of March? So, again, 23-1, important level. And um, it really just helps me kind of spot that stuff, high time frame. Def definitely worth it to check them out, play around with them a little bit more. Spend a couple hours. And if you find good strategies, feel free to sh ask, share, test them out, and see what works. You know, essentially what we're trying to do is just build a system um, where people can just, you know, plug and play, switch between different things as quickly as possible. And uh, the best way to do that is just by sharing the different information you get. This thing is just sending. Go. Hold on one sec. Any questions on stuff? And I know sometimes you'll get the errors because some of these indicators are very, you know, resource heavy. But essentially what we were trying to do too is just see the confluence of the different stuff. And uh, the crayons have been quite helpful for me just looking at local levels too. But even the bands, you know, where are we at? We're at the high of this range. We're at the high of this kind of stabilizing point. And it's um, generally pretty helpful as far as like break down a structure we start breaking down what's below us previous range levels back into these band structure so there's a lot you can do with it there's a lot of ways you can use it to effectively you know even now what do we have really high bullish volume what does that mean that means that if we if the next candle comes down below it that means all of these longs are essentially wrecked because that's where the majority of the volume that's in control is going you know anytime you have major green candles and then a following bad candle, that's usually a, tra a conditional move down uh, just because you, you see that kind of like change in the, in the demand for it. So, still looking good though. Still higher time frame is always the place to be. Essentially what I want to do myself is I don't mind getting chopped out some of these smaller moves, especially if I put like the ATR filter on and stuff, even for like the botting. Um, essentially all I care about is making sure I gain all these major moves. Which is what it's catching right now. So I know it's a lot of stuff, and it's it's kind of overwhelming when you start getting into like all the different resources, all the different things you can do with the indicators, you know, all the different customizations you can do yourself. But essentially, what you get in is the more you mess with them, the more you find like really what works compared to most other things, right? And um. And that's really all we're trying to do. To see, like, what I keep in here, I just broke both of them. Because it's too much to load for it right now. Yeah. So the highs of this move, essentially. Cherries are only connected. What's my weight based on my face? Oh, what are you doing over there? Kilograms. I'm American. I don't know what that means. I'll ask Siri. It's fine. Ninety-one kilograms. Okay. Hey Siri. Damn. What's my weight based? Essentially, large caps and stables. That's usually what I just run myself. Any questions, anything else, any comments? I'd love to hear what you guys think or any thoughts. Yes, no, all happy. Gucci, Gucci, Gucci. Gucci, Gucci. So yeah. Also, I mean a couple things to kind of keep in mind with these with this. Oh, I gotta reset this. Uh, with things like the, the stablecoin demand, this is still probably, you know, one of the easiest ones. And when you're seeing price disparity where we're actually seeing, um, uh, you know, stablecoin demand was higher here and stablecoin demand is lower here, but higher, price is higher. Essentially, you're seeing a deviation in stablecoin demand. 
where this if this starts closing below, even though it made new highs, this is the potentially liquidity grab, grabbing the previous highs that we've gone into uh, compared to the previous stuff. And technically, again, we're not actually making new highs. We're just kind of failing at the current high of the range until we break out of it. So there's a lot of ways to use this thing. The easiest way, is, the easiest way in my opinion, is to find something that works generally for most people. And when we start failing stuff, you know, the bands have become more and more a tool that I use lower time frame to scalp, uh, you know, that type of stuff. Using those kind of liquidity grabs, lower time frame on the core signals as well. Um, kind of turning it all together where it's like top of the bands, yellow dot, blue dot, you know, reversal, that type of thing. You can catch quick little moves, which are fun. And uh, it'll really, really, it's all about confluence and trade planning. So you can get some lower time frame plays in at the same time as your high time frame swings are consistently going. But yeah, that's the flow thing in a nutshell. So again, play around with it. If you see any good strats in the next week or two, we'll probably circle back around uh, as we kind of develop out some, some better strate strategies that we've kind of gamed out so to speak but um that's pretty much all i got for now um anything else otherwise i'll kind of cut it there nice little session and then um yeah we'll see what happens in the next week i've got i think i've got will on a couple times and smart on a couple times which will be fun for the streams and we'll do some more you know it's more trade planning, more specific to firing really hard, good trades. How to how to really spot you know the big stuff. You know, essentially, all we're really trying to do is say, well, we're still in an uptrend, that type of stuff, or we're still in a downtrend. And like, where do you have confirmation of these kind of failure levels? Why do we why do we really look at st stuff like swing levels? How do, why are the four hour swings becoming so important? Even you know at gain of level, loss of level stuff. And the more you start seeing this stuff, the more it starts clicking in your head of like, okay, it's the mid part of the range. It's also the, the gain of the four hour higher low that we did, blah, blah, blah. And it goes on and on and on. So we'll go through it and we'll, we'll continue to build out more stuff. Also, we're still working on the other indicator, uh, the MDVD. It's still going to be a little bit. We're, we're trying to tighten up the way it displays the data. What's that one? Um... That's... That's uh that's the multi-dimensional volume delta. So, oh yeah, yeah, that's uh, like the hour version of VPR. It's like VRVP, but session volume, and you can actually see the reversal of order flow by volume. So you can, it's not order flow as an indicator because you can't. That's way too much data to bring on to TradingView, but you can essentially see where the flow of money changes. And when you see the peaks and levels, you'll see that where, where you know, bulls capitulate or where bears capitulate. Which is, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit crazy, to be, to be honest. We're, we're just trying to refine the way it pr presents the data and then how we can put it in as alerts, like for changing, changing flow of data. Essentially, we won't be able to put that in as like, hey, you know, the four-hour order flow just got dumb, even though it's making new highs. Uh, four-hour order flow was just completely overtaken by, uh, you know, if it's an upside move like it is now, and then we see massive shorts come in that overtake the majority of, like, the block of longs. Essentially, that's the order flow saying um, that the people who are in longs above us are trapped. And if you trap enough people in positions, that creates fuel to the fire of like going up or down pretty hard. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff coming. Um, there is one thing you can um, touch on. Uh, I had some of the other guys ask me about liquidation levels earlier. Why, mm -hmm. why they are different on different time frames. You mean like, like these? Like five? No, the yeah, the lines. The they are different on like five minute to one hour, four hour. They're they're slightly different. I'm I'm sure you can explain it better than me. Uh. Yeah. So the thing with the liquidations. 
is that you're showing the daily liquidation on data. And some of the times, some of the candles in lower time frame, they appear a bit different based off the of liquidations. So like the liquidation levels, as an example, on like the five minute, and let me see if I can even get it to load on like the three minute or something like that. I've never used liquidations on low time frame just because it pulls daily liquidation levels and monthly liquidation levels. So the, the bit of disparity that you're seeing is only because there are multiple levels that pull in. So it changes the data ever so slightly. So it matches on what's going on on the chart. So it's not like it's an incorrect show of the liquidation data. It's essentially just showing you a bit more accurately on lower time frames. So when you see the lower time frame reversals, like if you're in a range, you start crabbing and then you see the 100x and the 50x, Usually you look to see which one, you know, is the major buyback, and then that's the continuation for that move. Or like here, you're breaking into some high time frame liquidations. You want to see if you start seeing the reversal to come back to the downside. But as far as the disparity, the disparity between the liquidation levels on high to low time frame, I haven't really noticed it. And if I, is it, is it significant or is it how many, uh, is it? It's a, it's, a, it's a few dollar, yeah. How many, what do you mean a few dollar, um, like one or two? When I checked earlier, it was like twenty twenty dollar between one and four, and then more down to the fifteen and five. Well, I'll have to look at that because if it's that much, and if it starts really dis making a disparity, then I need to start. We need to do a change on it. We haven't looked at that the code on it in a while, but let me double check it. You're pr def you're probably yeah you're definitely right. It says it is slightly different for different ones. So, thanks for bringing that to the attention. I hadn't noticed it. Oh, it's thanks to Ronster. He's the one that picked it up. Yeah. That's a good call. No, I, I... Yeah, again, this is not... In my opinion, the liquidation levels, like, again, the low time frames are for plebs. It's not for trading. It's, you know, one hour for me has always been pretty effective, but... I'll have to look into it. What time frame do you use... For liquidation, not to to see one the, hour, one one hour to four hour. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Even if you trade on like fifteen minutes, you you yeah, you but plot the I mean, on the one hour. Huh? Yeah, but even then, I don't ever really trade on the fifteen minute anymore. Yeah, I I know, but we have a lot of people that do that. So. Yeah, it's just it's not it's just not safe. It's just like there's no point to it. It's like I don't know. I I wish everyone would just take my advice. And that like Will and I always say is like start at the four hour and go from there because like the lower time frames are not your friends because it if everyone does the same thing on the low time frames right I could be on the one minute and like even here I was like oh we're breaking the upside we should come back and retest stuff why because you get tunnel vision looking at the local price action charts but what you really end up seeing is stuff like oh well what have we done on the one minute well we've done this we've gained the higher low of that range which is great we've retested the high of it. Every level that we're testing is testing bullishly. What do we not want to lose now, right? We don't want to lose, like, this structure, essentially. Right? And it, it, doesn't, it gives you tunnel vision to everything that's important that's above you. So, like, if you are going to trade the, high, the low time frames, and, like, in general, I think the best kind of advice is to split your screen. So, if you're split screening... You want to make sure that this thing's on like the four hour on, say, Bitcoin. And then you have your lower time frame on one as well. Oh, we're really here's, pushing now, huh? Yeah. Oh, I've got some of the old version of the indicators on here. <laughs> <laughs> Blast from the past. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't used those in like a year. But yeah. I, I asked Bing about that uh, liquidation thing, but I'm not sure if he understood my question. But he said it was like a trading view data limitation thing. About what? The um, liquidation level showing different. But I don't. Maybe he didn't understand what I asked about it. We could check it. But um, essentially, I would say plot them on the one hour to four hour, since yeah. that's the most accurate. And then a daily and above, it gets too low. T it'll actually pull data that it won't show liquidation levels from lower time frames at the daily and above. So if you're looking for like the most amount of liquidation data, you'd have to go to like the 12 hour. Because then it'll show, 
I see you have the old trading view uh, version too. They did some oh. stupid update now. It's so annoyed. What? And so like the, on the app or what? Yeah, no, on both the web and, and app. The auto down in the corner. You know the one that you click to reset the chart. Yeah. They took it away. Now you have to. Why? You have to double click the scale now to to get the same uh, function. Super annoying. Yeah. Yeah, they they did it first on the on the mobile app, and then on the desktop, and now, yeah, now also on the on the browser. Yeah, I'm on the desktop app now. I was I, I was uh, I was checking it out earlier, so I I loaded up my desktop app the same as you use. First, I had auto, and then I logged out and back in, and it was gone. It's like updated uh, when I logged in and out. So don't log out if you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it only when you log out and back in? Yeah, I think so. You, you Even lose... on the browser? Because I'm on the browser just now and it's got all... Yeah, mine got disappeared earlier today. Right, and I, I start checking it out and uh, search on the... And it ended up on a Reddit forum and uh, there uh, I saw the solution how to do it manually or like to double click the scale i've noticed the log button is gone yeah now i have to like right click it and go log or not log no. that bugs me changing stupid things that they don't have to change it's, uh, i yeah. don't know man I mean, uh, it, it, that's i mean you guys don't understand like how many times we've gotten like in the last three or four weeks Bing and I like testing stuff like, hey, they just broke this, and it's like, yeah, they did a shadow update, or they updated this, or they they pulled different data, or they changed the name of this for some freaking reason. Like, changing the name for Binance perp contracts is now USD.P, right? And that broke a couple of the things with like the, you know, the funding rates got broken twice or three times that you guys noticed, and there was like, a bunch of other stuff that we had to fix that nobody noticed because it went. We noticed it when it happened, and then we fixed it right away. Where we got a little bit of warning saying, hey, they're going to change this or that for no reason. But, um, like, on the indicator stuff, essentially, and, like, that's just my opinion, the higher the time frame you go under the daily, so, like, the 12 hour, not really a, a super important level. It kind of shows the mid range stuff to some degree. But uh, showing the liquidation levels seems to be extremely accurate, especially when you see stuff like, hey, what are we doing now? Like, essentially, this is like a band, right? Essentially, it's, it's all just a band of liquidity. So what are we doing? This move up just now took out all of the 10x shorts from the previous level. Where do we have to go now to take out 10x longs? You have to go here. What's that? It's also the 25.1. It's also the stuff at 24.8. Everything. So if they do want to start a major swing down, they can start losing some levels, and then we'll reassess when we go back here. But everyone's getting too bullish right now. I don't like it. If we lose a level now, we just drop everything and wait for the bottom? No, I mean, essentially, if we start losing the local stuff, I might be looking to short the local stuff back down here. That's my plan. Um, and then from there... I want to see what happens once we get back to this kind of the start of the move. If we start losing April Q2, I get a little bit sketched out. But if we start sliding this liquidity, I think there's enough liquidity here to take us into like this low. And if we lose that low, we're probably going to lose the low of the range and it's just going to be like a candle down. Um, yeah, that's where my stop loss is on most of them now. I, mo I moved it up yesterday. Like two lows from where we are on the, f on the four hour. That's, oh, yeah. that's where I put my stop losses now. All of them are in mad profit, so it's uh, just to secure if if we start dumping hard overnight or something like that. I mean, I don't know. I I, I keep my top stops way tighter than I probably should, just because I'd rather get stopped out in profit and then kind of like reassess, you know. Yeah, but I'm I'm not scalping. I'm uh, like long long swinging, you know. So it's. Uh... Oh no, I agree. I mean, like even the ones that we got when we got long again, like when we talked about it on stream, like Will and I back in March, we talked about like longing the shit out of this thing as we were breaking back above the levels. Um, 
Yeah, it was it was literally there when we talked about it back on the July Q3. I mean, all of those stops are back up here because like if these get taken out, that's fine. Like I don't care if it you know wicks me out because then I'll just buy the higher low in the continuation move. What I don't want to do is have it like have my stops like down here and then it just goes into the liquidity zone and then higher lows it and then does something like that. Yeah, I'd rather just that's get most likely what's going to happen, right? Uh, I don't know. Tick out I'm a our, little... our stops and then pump to heaven from there. Well, it's usually what happens. I mean, essentially, it's like you're going from liquidity to liquidity. And some of these guys who have the exchanges and all that jazz, they if they see the positions, like they're not they're not dumb. They see everything, all of the positions, all the liquidations. I mean, we like to think that you know Binance and all these other places, you know, aren't doing anything nefarious, but we know Binance is. We know FTX was, and they sell higher level data. <laughs> you yeah. got. On TikTok now, there is so many that's pissed off uh, FTT. <laughs> that pump they oh, had, yeah. the pump they had uh, last night after that news. Why are anyone buying that stupid exchange? It's fraud. <laughs> Yelling and screaming. I and mean, that's generally what it is, right? Yeah, I don't understand why it's even allowed to trade with it. You know? It's gambling, really. It's interesting to see sometimes the the flow the the stable coin go more down than the large cup go up. Well, yeah, I mean, that's because stable's only part of the equation. Yeah. A lot of trading I mean, into, into Bitcoin and stuff like that, too, so. Yeah, and funding's still pretty bullish in this zone, too. Very bullish. So they, they want us to go higher, huh? I mean, I saw some exchanges add some longs. If I look at um, like the previous data, they added to some longs in this zone, but you know they're pulling some shorts off, and that's usually like a good sign they're gonna keep. We'll see what happens. Their major shorts, like remind you, like they're a lot of these positions started getting super short back in. Oh, what was it? You know. March, April 1st of last year, when we saw that, when we had like that op giant opportunity to short the shit out of everything, and everybody did, because we said, hey, look what they're doing. So. Isn't it a new one today? Or? Mm, tomorrow. So the new one tomorrow should show us like this price action stuff, which it's all backdated. Don't it's not like it's. To see if they if they went long or they 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 adding to the shorts on that pump there. Yeah. If it does come out tomorrow, they're added to their shorts in this zone, uh, or the, the dealers intermediaries. I would probably be arguing more for retracement. But again, like. Even targeting the gaps above us and below us stuff. Like there's a CME gap right below us that we didn't fill. Or 28, 23. And if we what happens if we plow through that gap and we lose that low? Well you lose about like ten days, twelve days of liquidity that's right there. That takes you back into the, the lower part of that range. There's a lot more liquidity going I mean essentially it takes you back to this structure where you really need to hold. If you don't do that, like this is the last level to hold overall. And it doesn't look like it because we barreled through it. But if we don't hold 23.1, like there's a pretty good argument that we come back to the whole gap and this whole top size wrecked. And essentially you get like this big crabby stupid pattern, which um, kind of looks like, you know, this. And then the whole thing starts over.
if we, if we look at it as a tree drive, uh, where are we then in the? Should be close to the top, right? Not necessarily, because it depends what you call a drive and whatnot. Oh no! You know? Yeah, we can we can look at it as we are in the in the second, right? I mean, essentially, if, if you're looking at it, and that's if you're looking at it in like the essential, the essential pump. I mean, there's a there's a pretty damn good version of an Elliott wave um, that they updated the Elliott wave pattern. Uh, it's a pretty damn good one, and it generally plays out if you're going to do the Elliott wave stuff. Like, I'm not a big Elliott wave guy at all, but generally, when we get to the ends of these like upside moves, the expansions are pretty decent, and like when we actually get the retracements. It's auto plotting the the potential retracement from the high. So we were thought about doing one like this, but it's essentially like you know I don't trade LA wave patterns, but I will use them at like the end of moves or start of moves to kind of gauge what's going on. And a lot of times you get a lot of hindsight confirmation, but when you have stuff like this where we're showing you know five, and then you have the the correction. Let me see if I can do one better. I mean, everything's showing that this is the last little blow off wave potentially, even on the Elliott wave stuff, which I'm not a huge fan of it in general, anyways. But the fact that that's all saying the same thing that's like this drive up should probably be the end of this little expansion move. Eh. You know, it's. Essentially, it's taking us back to where we want to go, and potentially back to where we 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 don't want to go. You know, back into this stuff. And oops, there we go. If you look at like the higher time frame stuff, there's some good arguments for coming back down to like 25.1 again. It's a 0.5 retracement from the current high to the low. If we were to do it, so the more the more the same levels kind of like repeat over in my head, the more I start thinking about different levels based off of like what they're going to do. And when I see stuff like that, I was like, again, we see the exact level of 25.1 playing out. If we start breaking down structure, and this is like the three day, essentially, then I just look for higher level confirmation of stuff. And if we're doing the ABC correction, this is like the start of the one. And then we do the two. And then we do like the three, which is like the summer expansion, essentially. And then we have like the four, which is the really bad winter potentially. And then the five, which runs us flat going into the halvening in early of next year at like a weekly level. Let's see if the BLX gives us a better one. No, it's essentially the same. I mean, even even the monthly chart, if you're looking at that from like the highest time frame, is essentially doing the ABC, which it's not super helpful. Like I, like I said, but it does give us some good points to say, like, well, we're getting near the end of it, near the end of the move, I think, locally. What happened Doesn't with the, that Elliot guy, the Elliot wave guy we had? Oh, um, I don't know. He kind of dropped off. He got wrecked out because he was trading only Elliot waves and not, um, uh, <laughs> he, but he was also he doing, like, Ganfan. anyone else than, than what he was doing, huh? Yeah, God, I haven't talked to him it was like over a year, a year and a half. But yeah, he gave us uh, some decent charts uh, every now and then, you know. So. Yeah, no, but the problem was it's like a lot of these guys they start going down the rabbit hole because like they get really obsessed with the Elliott wave theory. And it's like, well, it's provable, right? Every single time, it's like yes and no. Most of the time, the Elliott wave data that comes out because if it was really just a cheat sheet that you could trade indefinitely, you'd you'd only trade that and forget everything else. And like that's kind of like the problem I have with it, and and most of it is like it's all hindsight because it's really easy to look to the left and be like, well, we did this, but now it's like, well, what's the, what are we doing now, and why is that relevant? Like, why is that important? And that's where like the use of the theory comes into play, which is, well, we've got you know from the daily time frame down to the four hour, we're doing a wave five expansion move. We're potentially doing. Uh, you know, double topping. It's not really a double top. It's like two days of difference. So it doesn't really matter. But where can we look at for potential retracement moves down? You know, sweeping back down to like the 0.5 or maybe even the start of the move to the 618. You know, lower time frame. These levels kind of like, they line up quite a bit with a lot of other price action stuff. Right? 
So it's never going to be perfect, but a lot of people will use this kind of calculation because when you when you get into Elliott Wave, the whole different retracement calculations, you can actually quantify it by a percentage of probability. Not that it's like super relevant, but then they'll go down the rabbit hole of like they'll do Elliott waves and then they'll get into GAN fans, like G-A-N-N fans, which is, you know, essentially this tool if you've ever messed with it. Um and that uh, one is too high tech for me. It's not I mean like it's just dumb. Like it's yeah, not it's like but trying to draw them manually is like crazy. Yeah. You know? It's like, so, so basically you pick top points and bottom points, like start of move, highs, compare it, like, they, they'll get into the GAN fan stuff, like, this is the way, you know, it's, it'll do this because of this expansion, and da, da, da. And, and then you have to put another one, so you get, like, squares and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, so then you get, yeah, so then you get, like, the, the fib, like, the, the fib wedges and stuff like that, and, like, it's just a bunch of nonsense. It's like there's this guy who does, like, on YouTube, who does really, really pretty circles of different price action movement doing like you know all of these things fib resistance arcs and stuff and it's like none of this shit it means anything like it doesn't actually do anything it, it's not like people actually use it but it doesn't actually give you like gan boxes gan square fix and stuff like that you know none of this stuff actually gives you anything. it's like elliott waves but what happens is they'll go into elliott waves because the theory is technically sound right it's not imp it's not provably wrong and then they make that their whole thing. And then they go down the path of Elliott Wave. And then they do GAN fans and boxes. And then essentially, from my understanding, that guy we had, I forgot his name, he started going into uh, some Zodiac shit, like Mercury retrograde theory and, um, you know, what was it? The full moon. Full moon. Uh, it's like moon. Moon phases, right? So like you have yeah, moon phases. Different of those, and they're just as crazy as oh my god. But yeah, but look at plenty it, of people that trade them. Oh yeah, like here, here's moon phases, right? Moon phases. This is this is the truth because it's the high, and then here's the high again, and it's it's called confirmation bias. Like that's the problem. Like it doesn't matter if it's provable. Like at the end of the day, the only thing you can literally say is, did we? You know, is the previous price action that we're doing a range? Yes or no. If yes, are we gaining above the range or are we losing the range and bearishly backtesting it? Essentially, what we're doing is flipping demand for something at a certain price into resistance. It comes, it flips from support to resistance or flipping from resistance at the highs to support. And that's all you're flipping essentially is, you know, supply at the highs because all this is supply. People trying to sell, there's more people wanting to sell at this price than there are buyers. And people who want to have de who have the demand, right? The demand to buy more than people that are willing to sell. If there's more people trying to buy something at a current price than there are people willing to sell at that price, the price increases to meet the supply. If there's more people selling than there are people buying at a current price, what happens is people will lower the price because not as many people want to, you know, basically I don't want to buy Bitcoin at 30.4, but I'll buy it at 29.7. And that's what happens. People will lower the price they want to sell at to keep selling. And that's all it is. It's, it's literally just macroeconomics over and over again. Supply and demand. Just Google supply and demand. It's the easiest way to understand why that is. But with markets, as we know, that's why we have all the different indicators to help us because markets are inefficient. They're, they're imbalanced. They're imperfect. Because if it was just perfectly, you know, liquidity, liquidity, like Forex, uh, which Forex gets a lot of, you know, a lot more mean reversion and stuff going into Forex than there is crypto. So it's a bit different to trade, significantly so. And, you know, there's other factors that come into play. But, you know, that's why we have all these other things. We've got funding rates. We've got overbought, oversold. We know for a fact that crypto tends to respect, uh, you know, that's why the oscillator is super effective because essentially crypto has a higher hit rate with um, all these different types of oscillators than other market types. So that's why we use it in combined with the gain or loss of level. But, you know, and then there's liquidations, there's liquidity, there's retail stablecoin demand, there's on-chain data, like there's all these other things that go into it. 
But yeah, don't. Uh, sorry for the rant, but yeah, for, uh, LA waves are LA waves are cool and all. Like, yeah, I know, but LA waves are cool and all. But at the same time, it's like, I mean, if you really are just trading Elliott waves, are you really making money? Maybe you're using it to time market cycles, which arguably the higher time frame traders, like the you know the funds and the guy, the institutions that have been around, like Buffett and all them. A lot of these guys just look at market cycles. That's all they do. Like they're they're not like the, the the wizardry that comes with these guys being successful over the time is a they have the money to move the markets, and b they can literally wait or they have waited between market cycles to basically buy stuff and sell stuff, and that's it. They wait like there. We look at like the four hours like a pretty good tool to find different things happen in the market. They won't go go behind below the daily or the weekly. You know, this is the time frame they're trading on. Oh yeah, we're definitely failing. We're failing the mid of this entire upside range. Okay, great. Well, we're going into a bear market. All these other indicators are going bear market, bear market. Well, we're going down. What are we doing now? We're gaining back over ranges. We've got stuff untested to retest at 25.1 and all these other things. So essentially what you do is if you play at a high time frame and you look at the high time frames, it's not really hard to see what's going on. It's like we're in a massive upside drive. Nothing says that we're supposed to stop until we break down and lose a level. What happens if we break down and close underneath like 29.4 at the end of the weekend? Like that's a level that I'm watching for the end of the week or the, the weekend structure. Like losing that range, that weekly range high, breaks us back down to potentially retest structure much lower, potentially down to like 24.2. 20, uh, 25.1 again like a lot of these levels are then placed for retesting a structure so if your time frame is high enough the markets become easy to trade you just look to buy stuff at major higher lows reversal points things that are changing but essentially we're still technically in a bear market even though we're now breaking into bull market summer lows right that's pretty crazy to think of but what else do we have well, we've got, you know, the dollar going down hard, being, like, targeted geopolitically. And we've got all these other things, like interest rates going super high. We've got banks failing from, um, you know, the super prime crisis that's, that's being caused. Compared to, like, 08, 2008, when we had the subprime mortgage crisis, now we have super prime bank crisis, where they can't afford all these high, all these high percentage rates are basically saying... Like why would I? Why would I go to you know buy a new house now and get locked in at a rate of like, you know five six percent or seven percent where I could just wait like three years? What happens to those banks that make money off of loans? They start failing, especially when they can't trade freaking treasury bonds because they're dumb. You know, they don't look at stuff. But essentially, that's all it is. The high time frame trading is the best. It's like why we do the four hour. The four hour is the easiest higher time frame to kind of look at and say like, well, what are we doing? We're gaining above major levels. We're creating new highs. Like we did that in the current four hour. We popped a new high. Priority still up until we start failing structure. So if we start closing the four hour back down below this, like below 30.2, 30 essentially, what have we done? Another liquidity grab. But yeah, that's enough of me ranting, <laughs> I think. Uh, essentially, I guess the big thing there is have a play with the flow index. I think that's going to be a lot of fun for people to kind of use. Um, don't get sucked into the low time frames. Like, that's just a constant problem that I've had that I still have sometimes and a lot of people have is getting sucked into the low time frames of, well, what are we doing? It's like, what's happening with 15 minutes? I want to catch this move. This is like X amount of percent. So... You know, that type of thing. It's really easy to do as well to get sucked into those low time frames. But yeah, I think that's it. I'm going to get out of here. I've got a couple things I got to do around the house. Um, any other questions? Anything pressing? Comments? Eggle, anybody? No, I think it's okay. Uh, what should I call mm. this uh, recording? Flow? Uh yeah, it's just flow and indicator confluence, but I'd say probably chop it up so you leave me ranting and like going on like. Oh no, no, that's the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> that's the entertainment at the end. Yes, and there is a lot of good of info there too. So. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, thanks. It's yeah. Essentially, what we're trying to do is just trying to find the important stuff that matters. And if it was really easy enough, I could just say, "Well, turn this on and just use you know use your brain of like, hey, that's the swing, you know, that type of stuff." Or there's the swing above us. That's important. It just gets a little bit easier and easier over time. Yeah, practice make perfect. Huh? Yeah, it's just I mean it, it's a time thing. It's a you know a, a friend of mine who's like he always said like you know you you only learn through doing. This isn't something you can read a book on. You can't just watch YouTube videos. It's like you, even if you're grading on the lowest amount of exposure, which you probably should, stick your ass in the four hour. Trade like one percent of your total account or less on zero leverage or like the lowest leverage you can if you're trying to short, and then and then get to the point where emotionally profits and losses don't mean shit to you, and then it's already expanding from there, and that's like the hardest thing to do because everybody wants to make the money. Learning from your mistakes. Yeah. Yeah, and then, and, and if if you're gonna watch YouTube, watch the fireside recordings, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't. Yeah, just I mean, like nothing else know. matters. Well, some some of these people, man, it's like I get so mad that people like I think they're gonna come after Bitboy and some of the other people pretty hard eventually because essentially what they've done is criminal. I mean, is he is he still, yeah. still sending? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I haven't seen him. Like, there's a there's a. Uh, YouTube attorney that I watch, I'm sure he was investigating him. Sure I mean, yeah, he streams He streams to, like, 40,000 people every day. It's mental. Right? I mean, and this guy has no idea how to trade. Absolutely zero idea how to trade. He's never posted a single good trade system, trade setup, talked about TA. All he does is shill. All he does is shill coins, and it's so shill coins, he's pumping his own bags, and then they drop them on the poor innocent. This and he's, you know, I mean, he's worth a hundred million dollars. I mean, it's the amount of money him and Crypto Moon make. I mean, like him and the Moon make so much money. It's it's absolutely silly. Like Moon, the Moon. Um, I think he he's worth like three hundred mil or something like that. Yeah, I mean, he's the dude's getting like, um, he's getting 13, 20,000 views every day, or every day he streams. What was that? Uh, Carl? View software, you yeah. Show as well. uh, he's he's uh, moved over to TikTok now. Yeah, I mean, he's yeah, taking the damn money. Ton of followers on TikTok. And a lot of the smaller ones uses him as like a guest. He he comes to their streams and like live trading shit coins and stuff like that, pumping their uh, accounts too. So but he's he's a he's a smart one, right? He he do it right. He's he's successful mm. in business, you know. So he done some stupid stupid crazy mean shit, but it's. I mean, he's made up. He makes he makes about a hundred. He makes about a hundred grand a day. Roundabouts in a bear market, it's probably closer to seventy. Bull market, he was making a hundred plus a day. Entirely off of referral links, he wasn't trading. None of these guys do, unfortunately. But that um. The Chris guy, haven't we heard much about lately, huh? Which one? The, the taxi driver, MM Crypto. Uh, I haven't heard about him in a long time either. I haven't really looked. I don't. I mean, I don't follow them. The so. Last, last I saw was he was roaming around in, in his new apartment, bragging about it, how good it was. Two-story apartment, <laughs> and he have a elevator in it because he's too damn lazy to walk the stairs. Yeah. He's he's doing also the same amount as as Moon. But haven't they gone down a little bit? Yeah, but I mean, at the same time, it's like 
most of the money they make they tell it's by telling people to like cross leverage long it was like another guy on here that streamed on trading view it was some i haven't seen him in a while but it was like some dude called enthused on trading view was streaming and he was he was telling people to cross leverage and put 20 percent of positions but only if you're trading on my ref link because then he gets all the money that you he gets the value of the, the trading fees which is criminal I don't know. I don't trust anyone that tells anyone who doesn't know how to trade to go high leverage with cross leverage. That's like an instant red flag for me that says you don't care about shit. Like that means that like the people's people trading on your ref link is your profit and not like them learning from you teaching something or telling them something or giving them access to something. Yeah, and and they're full of it. They really don't understand it. No, I mean it's it's an, it's essentially just a scam. I mean, essentially, it's just it's like they don't care about the churn rate, about the people. When like the the better mentality is like, well, wait a second, if we actually give them good tools, good price action, thinking about stuff rationally and logically through different price action stuff, technical analysis, fundamental analysis, and then they get better over time, and they're trading bigger, bigger and larger amounts. Then they'll make money more, more money eventually in the long run. But none of these guys do that. Mo well, there's a couple of guys that are good out there, but essentially the ma the majority of the big ones. I mean, not even the majority. All of the big ones are essentially just scammers that just essentially create content to get people to trade on their stuff, and then their people, their followers are their product. It's an easy. It's almost an easier way to trade than to do. Um, you know, it's easier to do that than it is to actually trade, which is fair. I mean, it's kind of shitty, but it is what it is. Yeah, and then they put a trend line on the chart, and when the price go over, they post a signal, huh? So make everyone go long. Cross 20x. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, essentially, they just do this. They say, like, well, this is a trend, and this is a trend, so then... You do the the difference in the high, the low, the move is the breakout move of the trend line, which is like literally TA not to do 101, which everyone does. The famous measured move. Yeah, the measured measured. God damn it! It's so dumb. It is what it is, though. Unfortunately, I don't know. I think it's better to like train people up so they can actually make it. You make more. You make more over time. People do better. Everybody wins. Yeah. Instead, they and just better, have losers. Um, better job satisfaction as well. Well, yeah. Plus, I, I don't know how they live with themselves, man. I couldn't, like, fucking shilling shit coins all day long and then, like, scamming people to pump your own bags. Like, how do you fucking sleep at night? In luxury, man. In luxury. Oh. That's I the feel gross. way, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. I wouldn't be able to sleep. No, oh, my trend lines, my trend lines. But yeah, it was fun. It's nice, it's fun shit talking bad actors. But yeah, I'm gonna bounce now. You guys are welcome to stick around and do your own thing, but I gotta, I gotta do some stuff now. Cool, cool. Well, what time's man. next, uh, next Fireside? This Tuesday or? It'll probably be Tuesday again. Um, I don't really think I have time. I got a bunch of things going on real life that I got to fix and uh, I got family coming back over. So it's like I got to clean and get the house in order and oh. all this in-laws, you know, <laughs> yeah, need to be clean before they come. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I know that feeling. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, really good stream today. So, Oh, well, thanks man. Just hope the recording is okay. Um, I'm guessing it is. We shall see. Well, I'll take it. Um, I'm leaving. I'll, you guys take it easy. I'll catch you guys later, all right? One and a half hour. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might want to cut it down a bit. Yeah, no. They, they, they can have it all. It's good ones. <laughs>